Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for all of your blessings in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the gift of faith. And we thank you, Father, for your grace that you continue to grow us in our faith and our walk with you. We pray now, Father, as we turn and focus on the words of your Son and our Savior Jesus, that you would plant these words deep within our hearts and deep within our minds, that the faith that you gave to us would bear the fruit that you desire, that we would be blessed, that others would be blessed, that you would be glorified. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory and all of God's children, we all say, amen. Guys, we're going to start with... Um, Luke 14, verses 1 to 4. So let me read it for us. It says, One Sabbath, uh, Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. They were watching him carefully. There was a man before him who had dropsy. Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So he took him, the man with the dropsy, and healed him and sent him away. And our our sermon is titled, Healing Comes on the Sabbath. Now, you know, the Sabbath is supposed to be an enjoyable experience. It's supposed to be um, a time of, of relaxation, a, a time of reflection on all that God has blessed us with, uh, a time of restoration. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be enjoyable. Um, this was not one of those Sabbaths. <laughs> this, this was a trap, okay? Jesus is invited to the home of this Pharisee. There's going to be all these religious leaders there. And there's a man who has dropsy. And, um, and this, man, this man did not barge into this party. He didn't invite himself. No, he was not there improperly. He was there at the invitation and the collusion of that religious leader and that cabal of religious leaders. And, uh, and he was there as the bait to try and get Jesus to say or do something by which these religious leaders could thereby prove that Jesus is not the Messiah. Now, I mentioned to you a little bit before about dropsy. It's not a term, if you Google it right now, it's not a term that you're going to find in current medical journals a whole lot. Uh, what you're going to find instead is a term called endema. And it is, um, it's a problem. It's, it's really, it's a symptom. And uh, it's a situation where the person who has it, their body retains fluid, and it becomes very, very uncomfortable. Uh, their skin becomes tight, their, their joints stiffen. Um, and as I did the research for the sermon for today, I could not find anywhere really where dropsy is called out in the Old Testament. In fact, to be honest with you, this is the only place in the entire Bible where this word is even used. And um, so it's not called out in Leviticus anywhere as, as making somebody uh, un, unpure um, in the Levitical laws. But it was definitely at that time still a purity issue in the sense that if you had this problem, just like if you had any sort of physical problem where your body swolled up or shrunk down, where you had any sort of physical problem, it was a sign of God's disfavor. Now, this person who has this endema, we shouldn't, if all we do is look at this person and say, well, that was an unfortunate person. He, he was going through a medical problem. It's sure, sure, was, sure bad to be him then we're kind of missing the deeper theological point. Because the deeper theological point is that all disease, all death, is in this creation as the result of the fall in sin. And so that's really, of course, what Jesus has come to address. And that's how we should always look, uh, partly at least, at how we, how we look at the miracles of Christ. And speaking of looking closely, uh, we see here that these religious leaders, they were watching Jesus closely. They had set a trap for him. They were watching him closely, but Jesus also was watching them closely. Did you catch that? It says, and he responded to them. And so he knows he's being watched. He's watching them. And when he asked them the question, he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? I mean, he puts a fine point to it. He wants to hear what they're going to say, and they won't respond. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Now, why is it that Jesus always seems to be getting into a controversy regarding the Sabbath? 
Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why is that? Well, I, 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 that, I want to address that with you a little bit today. If you go in your Bibles, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you're going to see uh, a, the prayer of Israel. It's called the Shema. Any good Orthodox Jewish person knows this prayer. A lot of Christians know this prayer. It, it goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema. What follows in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is what is universally taught by rabbis as the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And Jesus would add, and with all your strength. So, so there's the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the greatest commandment. Now here's the thing you may not be aware of, but what you need to know and that is that in Jesus' day, there was two rabbinical schools of thought. And it had to deal with what was then the second greatest commandment. And you might be asking yourself, well, what difference does it make what the second greatest commandment is? It makes all the difference in the world. Because the second greatest commandment then is going to spell out how we keep the first greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. But how then do you do that? How do you love the Lord your God? And so the rabbis in Galilee, what they taught based on Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 is that the second greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. Should sound familiar to you. Because that's also what Jesus taught. He taught that many times. And many times, his teaching on that was accepted. But many times, it wasn't. Because there was another set of rabbis, and these were the rabbis closer to Jerusalem geographically, and they believed that, no, the second greatest commandment was to honor the Sabbath. And so what they would say, what they would say is that the way that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, is by honoring the Sabbath. But what Jesus, our Lord and Savior, says, no, guys, the way that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so he'll teach parables on, on who is your neighbor and to what extent should you go to love your neighbor and how we're to treat our neighbors equally without regard to their position in life and how we are to give of what we have to care for our neighbor. This today is the fourth Sabbath confrontation that Jesus has. In Luke chapter 6 and verses 1 to 6, we, uh, verses 1 to 5, we read the first Sabbath confrontation. It's when Jesus is going through the fields with his disciples and they eat the grain on the Sabbath. And, and these religious leaders, they have a conniption over it. And the next confrontation that Jesus has regarding the Sabbath is then also recorded in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11, where Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath who has a shriveled right hand. And then it's in Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, where we see the third Sabbath confrontation that Jesus has, also in the synagogue. And in Luke chapter 13, we read about the woman who had a physical disability for 18 years. And Jesus heals her in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders have a problem with him doing this. And so then Jesus says something in response to those religious leaders that's going to sound a lot like what he says today. But it's just a little twist to it. Jesus says to those religious leaders, he says, which of you, if you have an ox on the Sabbath, would not untie him and take it to water so that it could drink? How much more so should a daughter of Abraham who has been bound up for 18 years be loosed of this infirmity that has been upon her. And it says the exact same thing. They could not respond to what Jesus says. And Jesus says much the same here today. And this is not only the fourth Sabbath confrontation, it's the third time that the Pharisees have hosted a dinner for Jesus. This is the third time. They do this stuff all the time to him. 
They host a dinner, and then they bring him in, and then they start to criticize him or set him up. The first time that this happens is when a a quote-unquote sinful woman touches Jesus, and they condemn Jesus for for letting this quote-unquote sinful woman touch him. And then the second time that they criticize Jesus is when he doesn't wash his hands before he eats. They criticize him for breaking the purity laws. And again, they're criticizing him today. So how does Jesus respond? It's so important to notice because in our readings for today, we have included in our gospel reading for today two of the parables that Jesus teaches in response to this situation. And these, both of these parables have to do with banquets. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because he's there eating a meal. That's the context. He's there having the Sabbath meal with these religious leaders. And so he, he uses a banquet for his metaphor. And in the first teaching, did you notice? Did you notice in the first teaching regarding the banquet, Jesus uses Proverbs 25, which we just heard read, Proverbs 25, verses 6 and 7, sort of as the basis of his parable. Let me read these words again. Proverbs 25, 6 and 7 says, Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence, For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. The first parable warns against seeking honor. The second parable that Jesus teaches warns against ignoring the poor for the purpose of self-gain. But in the Gospel of Luke, if you open up your Bibles, you'll see that it doesn't end with two parables. It goes on and Jesus teaches a third parable in response to the behaviors of these religious leaders at this banquet. You see, they've set up a banquet to judge Jesus. But what Jesus needs them to know and needs you to know and needs me to know today is that God has set up a banquet for us. And that it's not going to be Jesus who's going to get judged. It's going to be you and I and how we respond to the invitation that goes out. And so it's interesting if you stop and study just a little bit the excuses that are cited in this parable. Because the excuses that are cited in this parable are the exact same reasons. Are you ready for this? They're the exact same reasons that you'll find in Deuteronomy chapter 20. And what does Deuteronomy chapter 20 talk about? These are the reasons for which you do not have to go to war. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? So these reasons that are cited in that parable, they're good enough to get you a draft deferment so you don't have to put on the uniform of the country, but they are not good enough, quote unquote, to get you out of the invitation to the king's banquet. And so the irony is just so rich here. But you know, really the question before us today is so what? That's the great Lutheran question, right? What and so what? That's what you find in the catechism. And so, so what? So what does this mean to you and I today? So what? So what is the Sabbath for us today? Is it just about God and me, me and God? Is it just about my personal relationship with Jesus? What is the second greatest commandment today? And the second greatest commandment today is the same one that Jesus taught, to love your neighbor, how? As yourself. Everybody say that. As yourself. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and we are to love our neighbor as ourself. But you know, the question then becomes, do you even know who your neighbor is? As you think about the street that you live on, I want you to think about that for a second. And you think about those houses that are next to you. Are you thinking about that retirement center that you live in? And you think about those apartments that are next to you. Do you know who your neighbors even are? And when was the last time you asked one of them something as simply Christian as this? How could I pray for you? Because you see, we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves today. And, and this is a challenge for us just as it was as it was then. When we see this healing that Jesus performs, brothers and sisters, let's not miss this. 
when Jesus heals, one of the primary reasons why he does this is to point to what the new creation is going to look like. The new creation is going to be one where it says in Revelation, there will be no more death, there will be no more disease, there will be no more crying. All of these things will be gone. And so when Jesus performs these miracles, he yes, he's pointing to the new creation. But so why is it that those religious leaders won't answer when Jesus asks them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? One reason why they won't answer is because they know. <laughs> they know what Jesus wants to do. And what is it that Jesus wants to do? Jesus wants to heal this man. And so when they don't answer him, does he just sit there and say, well, I guess I don't know what to do now. You got me. You didn't answer, so I'm just kind of stuck. Nope. He goes ahead and heals. And they don't want that to happen because with every miracle, it's just a further proof, attestation, if you will, that Jesus, in fact, is the Messiah. And one of the ironies also is that many religious leaders then, as well as Jewish religious leaders to this day, they believe that, and they believed back then, that if all of Israel would just perfectly keep the Sabbath just once, that then what would happen? That the Messiah would return, right? And so here we see in this reading for today, the grace and the mercy of God, that he sends the Messiah regardless of how imperfectly we keep the Sabbath. Can we give God a praise clap for that this morning? Amen. Amen. You see, on this, ha on this Sabbath, Jesus heals a man of dropsy. It's going to be the Sabbath after the Passover that is soon to be upon Jesus. It's going to be on that Sabbath where Jesus is going to be laid in the tomb. His body is going to be overcome by the curse of sin, which is death. And he's going to take upon his body the curse of all of our sin. Why? So that then when he rises from the dead, that we also will be able to rise from the dead. Through this, he provides the way to the new creation, through the healing that he provides on the Sabbath. And how does he provide healing for us today? He provides healing for us today in the waters of baptism. In the waters of baptism, you are healed of sin. You are healed of death. And in the Lord's table, you receive Christ's body and his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. There is healing that's going to happen for us today. Now is that time in the message where I ask you to help me remember something which is the mission statement of our church. And our mission statement as a church is a wonderful one, that we're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel. And we're going to do this by focusing on, on how many things? Millie, how many things? Three things, right? We're going to focus on our, on our preaching, on our teaching, and on living our daily lives. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is like unto it, to love your neighbor. How? As yourself, right? That's, that's the part that we say is living, living our daily lives. See, the thing about dropsy is it's an insidious problem. Because one of the, one of the things that happens to people who have dropsy is that they become very thirsty. Isn't that tragic? Because dropsy, remember what I said dropsy is? Dropsy is the retention of what? Of fluids. That's exactly right. And so somebody who has dropsy is a very thirsty person. And if they're not careful, they're going to drink more and more water, and they're going to do what to their symptoms? They're going to but exasperate it right? They're going to make it worse. And so Jesus is here, and we see from the teachings in the parable regarding the banquet that the religious leaders of that time, they struggled with at least three things to be sure. They struggled with a preoccupation of popularity. They struggled with a preoccupation of honor, and they struggled with a preoccupation of money. And you see, they're kind of like the person who has spiritual dropsy. 
Because, because if you have that problem, you're just going to want more and more and more of the very thing that, that causes the problem. Now, Jesus heals the person who has the physical dropsy and sends him away. He's healthy. He doesn't need to be around these people who've got the deeper spiritual problems. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called as Christians to love our neighbors as ourselves. And why is that? Because in loving our neighbors as ourselves, then the spiritual problem of wanting more and more for yourself is addressed in a Christ-like way. Some people say it's kind of shocking that a church would do a fundraiser to help public school kids. They're not even sure that that's a Lutheran thing to do. Why would you do that? Why Why would you have a fundraiser to help out kids in a public school. I don't know, because 99% of the kids go to public school. How about that, for starters, right? But they're surprised that the Lutheran church would, would do that, would be concerned about the well-being of children in a more disadvantaged community. But brothers and sisters in Christ, I would submit to you that that's exactly what Jesus is talking about today. To loving your neighbor as yourself, to being concerned for those who are less well off than you are. Jesus said, it's better to give than to receive. And when we think about endema, when we think about dropsy, we know that those words are literally true. It's better to give than to receive. And in blessing others, we find that we ourselves are the ones who are blessed. Because we've been healed with the healing that comes on the Sabbath. Amen? Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.